pulmonary stenosis may exist as a single defect or may be present in combination with other defects, such as the overriding of the aorta, interuracular or interventricular communications, patent ductus arteriosus, and the like. The stenosis may be valvular or infundibular or both. If the stenosis is purely valvular, the outflow tract of the right ventricle is normal. The pulmonary artery may be hypoplastic, normal, or dilated. If there is infundibular stenosis, the outflow tract of the right ventricle is interrupted by a ridge of tissue. In effect, a defective septum which encroaches upon its lumen and contributes to the formation of a fifth cardiac chamber. This chamber may be so small as to be inappreciable when the ridge of tissue is immediately subvalvular or it may be quite large when the septum is lower in the ventricle. As in the case of valvular stenosis, the pulmonary artery may be hypoplastic, normal, or dilated. Whatever the type of defect, the ultimate effect is the same. Blood cannot pass with ease into the pulmonary circuit. Russell Claude Brock Baron Brock 24th of October, 1903 to the 3rd of September, 1980 Russell Brock was a leading British chest and heart surgeon and one of the pioneers of modern open heart surgery. Surgery of the pulmonary valve began with Baron Dr. Russell Brock of Guy's Hospital, who was the first to consistently attempt surgery on pulmonary stenosis since Doyen's ill-fated attempt in 1913, and Thomas Seller's single successful case in 1947. M. Doyen French surgeon sided with the first deliberate intracardiac operation, 1913. Sir Thomas Holmes Sellers. The Blalock, Tossig shunt or baby blue operation was typically performed in cases of severe pulmonary stenosis, which resulted from a congenital defect. Blue babies, pre-1950s, Helen Tussog, MD, and Blalock Thomas. Tossig Shunt, 1944. Many were satisfied with this indirect vascular shunt approach because it allowed excellent palliation of complex congenital cardiac defects. Example, tetralogy of phallate, without having to use cardiopulmonary bypass, which was still experiencing devastating problems. Why even attempt a direct repair of congenital pulmonary stenosis? In addition, it was thought that most cases of pulmonary stenosis were infundibular or subvalvular in nature, and thus could not be treated with the new techniques recently developed by Harkin and Bailey for mitral stenosis. Dwight Emery Harkin, MD, an all-American surgical giant, pioneer cardiac surgeon, teacher, and mentor. After a few disastrous clinical cases, with the cardioscope invented by Allen and Graham in 1922 to enable direct vision within the closed heart. Brock developed his own version of a valvulotum and dilating forceps to incise the valve and enlarge the orifice in a blind procedure. Pulmonary valvulotum. Cutting punch for excising, obstructing, and fundibulum tissue. He was successful in correcting the valve of an 18-year-old girl on February 16, 1948. She had been cyanosed since birth with the history of squatting and clubbing of the fingers. Characteristic of the morbid serolunus ailment, the patient survived and was known to be doing well two months later after some complications with peripheral emboli. Even though Thomas Holmes Sellers technically performed the first successful clinical pulmonary valve operation, Brock is typically credited as a move thoroughly exposed the subject and published first. Brock's other two cases were also considered to have excellent results. An 11 years old girl was able to lead a completely normal life, and another patient was able to conceive after her operation. Dr. Brock took treatment of pulmonary stenosis a step further by creating a surgery for resection of infundibular stenosis by blindly removing the intruding cardiac wall with a punch in 1949. Of the 11 initial operations performed by Brock for this ailment, 
eight survivors were known to be alive and improved over a year later. Brock was one of the world's greatest heart surgeons. He spent over 30 years working in the surgical department of Guy's Hospital and Brompton Hospital in London. Since the Victorian era, heart surgery had been deemed impossible due to the complex structure of the heart. Operation on the adjacent blood vessels took place, but there were few survivors. During the 1940s, Brock was a true cardiac pioneer operating on the internal structure of the heart. He was the first to treat defective heart valves and the first to transplant a length of main cardiac artery. He even designed his own tools and successfully operated on defective valves removing blockages from the blood vessels of the hearts of three young girls of whom survived. His pioneering spirit and surgical expertise was recognized all over the world. He was knighted in 1954 and then granted a life period in 1965, taking as his title Lord Brock of Wimbledon. He lived in the old rectory, a Tudor building on Church Road in Wimbledon between 1953 and 1978, and then later moved to three Parkside Gardens from 1978 and lived at the property until his death in 1980. Brock's Operation when, whom, how to perform. One of the biggest problems remaining in the surgical treatment of Fallot's tetralogy concerns the management of right ventricular outflow obstruction in patients with severe hypoplasia of the pulmonary artery and annulus. In 1948, Brock, using a cardioscope of his own design, attempted to visualize a pulmonary valve and relieve pulmonary stenosis by way of the left pulmonary artery. After three unsuccessful attempts, he abandoned the technique. Brock concluded that visualization of the pulmonary valve from the pulmonary artery before surgically relieving the stenosis carried too high of a risk. He then turned to Doyen's transventricular approach using a specially designed spade-shaped knife. Subsequently, an expandable metal dilator was added to split the valve leaflets further after passage of the valvulotum. Using this technique of pulmonary vulvulotomy, he and others achieved good results with low risk to the patient. Indications for Brock's operation When Blalock or other shunts have failed and the patient is still not a good candidate for total correction, where there is associated significant unilateral absence, stenosis, or hypoplasia of the pulmonary vessels. When occlusion of the pulmonary artery for performance of an anastomosis may be hazardous. When sternotomy has been performed with a view to total correction, but unfavorable anatomy has been encountered, and if satisfactory results are not being obtained with anastomotic operations. Surgical Steps of Brock's Operation 1. Medium sternotomy performed to expose a heart 2. Thymus dissection done 3. Pericardium opened in the midline The treatments of tetralogy of phallet are surgical procedures to help fix the following four heart problems A ventricular septal defect, or VSD an overriding aorta happens when the aorta is located directly over the ventricular septal defect. This means the aorta is connected to both the left and the right ventricles instead of its normal attachment to only the left ventricle. In preliminary stenosis, the main preliminary artery is narrowed and the preliminary valve doesn't open up all the way and right ventricular hypertrophy means the wall of the right ventricle is thicker than normal. Tetralogy of phallet is repaired with open heart surgery, either soon after birth of an infancy. Surgical procedures may include temporary and complete repairs. Your child may not be ready for a complete repair right away. In this case, a temporary repair, such as a shunt or Brox operation, can be placed. Here we discuss about the Brox operation. 4. Systemic heparinization done. 5. 
purse string sutures are placed in the ascending aorta for arterial cannulation and either bicaval cannulation or right atrial single cannula. 6. Aorta is cross-clamped and cold cardioplegic solution is infused. Crystalloid or blood cardioplegia. 7. Incise a infundibulum by doing infundibulectomy. 8. Pulmonary annulus and valve should be preserved. 9. Right ventricular outflow tract, RVOT, should be sized just to the required size of the HEGARD dilator to prevent pulmonary flooding and right ventricle distension due to excessive pulmonary regurgitation. 10. RVOT patch should be taught and try to use PTFE polytetrafluoroethylene patch or bovine pericardial patch so the native pericardium is retained for subsequent corrective surgery. 11. A non-distensible RVOT patch also helps that in ensuring the energy of RV contraction is transmitted to the distal pulmonary vascular bed rather than expanded in distending a redundant RVOT patch. 12. Right ventricle RV pressure should be just subsystemic and a pulsatile pulmonary artery flow should exist. 13. When performing CPB with the beating heart to improve safety, the root can be kept on continuous suction with head down to prevent air embolism. 14. Cardioplegia can be used at the discretion of the operating surgeon. <laughs>